I want to speak a message to you today that I've entitled, Among the Masses. Among the Masses. And today what we're going to do is we're going to get our scripture from 1 Samuel 17. So if you want to open your Bibles there, uh, this is where we're going to, to speak from today. Now I want you to imagine that there's a little child. Um, not a little, little child, let's say 8 years old, 9 years old, 12 years old, that age group. And let's say they're out hanging out with their friends. And they're all hanging out and they're having a good time. And their friends decide that what they want to do is they want to go into the local convenience store and they want to steal a chocolate bar. Now, this kid knows right from wrong. He's been raised in a good home and he knows it's wrong to steal. He's been taught at school it's wrong to steal. But it just so happens that this little fellow's been going to Sunday school. And so he also knows that God sees all, right? God is hovering and watching. No sin is hidden from God. And so he's terrified and he, he knows that I should not steal this chocolate bar, right? And so he knows everything inside of him is screaming, do not do this. But there's another side to this story. See, the other side of it is this. If his friends do this and he doesn't get involved in it, and they get away with it, he's going to be seen as the weak one. He's going to be seen as the wimpy kid, right? In fact, if he stands up and he tells them this is wrong, it might be that those friends might not hang out with him anymore. They might not want anything to do with him anymore, and he might lose all of his friends. And so knowing this and knowing that this is a dilemma of a small child, what would you say that 90% of those kids are going to do? They're going to steal the chocolate bar, aren't they? They're going to go in with their friends, and even though everything inside them is saying, don't do it, even though everything inside them is saying, this is the wrong decision, they're going to go, and they're probably going to do it. See, he's going to follow the masses. He's going to follow them out of fear. He's going to follow them out of fear, and he's going to make choices that he knows he shouldn't make. Not only is he going to make choices that he knows he shouldn't make, he's going to make a choice that he doesn't want to make. He doesn't want to be part of that. He doesn't want to steal that chocolate bar. But the fear of exclusion, the fear of not being part of the masses, the fear of being isolated will cause that child to make decisions that he knows is wrong and decisions that he does not want to do. Now, the reality is this, that child's going to grow up. We all grew up, right? I've told this week that I looked like I was a 12-year-old, so maybe I'm not growing up quite as quick as, as other people. But that's a good thing I hear. And so, so the truth is this, we are all going to grow up. And suddenly, it's not going to be a few friends around us that is going to influence us anymore. Now, it's going to be an entire culture that's going to begin to influence us. It's going to be an entire culture that's, that's going to get us to make choices that maybe we don't really want to do. We've seen in recent years that if, if you stand against what the culture says is good, if you stand against what the culture says is right, that you're probably going to be called names, that you're probably going to be ostracized among the media, that you're probably going to be put down and destroyed. So out of fear and out of a desire to be accepted amongst our peers, we as the church have begun to support those things that we know is wrong, according to the Bible. The church in a whole has even begun to say things that we maybe don't even really believe ourselves. It's just the right thing to say. It's the proper and, and politically correct thing to say. And it's all out of this desire not to be isolated, not to be misused, not to be not liked. That was a double negative. But could it be that maybe we've reached this pivotal moment in church history? Is it possible that we've reached this pivotal moment where the church needs to decide whether we are going to follow a culture out of fear of being ridiculed or hated, or if we are going to follow the Word of God? Is it possible that the church has reached this moment in history? See, 
we're going to take a look at two people today. Two people who faced the exact same battle, exact same battle, but both of them took two different courses through what they were facing. And we're going to see that there's a different outcome with both courses. And so let's turn to 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 8. And the Bible says this, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you call all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will all be your slaves. But if I kill him, then you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. When Saul and the Israelites heard this, they were terrified and deeply shaken. Now, God, when he created this nation of Israel, when he brought them out of the land of Egypt, his purpose was to have a theocracy for government. Now, a theocracy is quite simple. Everyone it follows the leading of God. There is no actual king. There's no actual leader per se. But what happens is, is when the enemy begins to come in and fight, God will raise up a deliverer. God will raise up someone, empower someone. They will fight the enemy and there will be victory. We saw it all throughout the early stages. And then suddenly... Israel, the Bible says, has this hardened heart. Now, hardened heart in Scripture means rebellious. They had this rebellious heart that refused to follow what God wanted to do. And they said, we don't want a theocracy anymore. What we want is we want a king. Just like the other nations, we want a king. So the Bible says, because of their hardened heart, God gives them a king. Now, he gives them this king by the name of Saul. And Saul is handsome. Saul is heads and shoulders above everyone else. Saul is a warrior. Saul is the perfect king in the natural. He is what everyone would want for a king. And so he gives them this king to, to lead and to protect the nation of Israel, right? But now here we arrive at this battlefield. We've arrived at this battlefield and this enemy is standing before them. And this enemy has brought fear to the entire nation. This enemy is a giant by the name of Goliath. The Bible says that he is taunting the entire nation. He's taunting God. He's taunting everything that is God. And so here the Bible says that not one of them was willing to go out and fight. Not one of them was willing to stand before Goliath. You have an entire nation of people, warriors, who are standing there, who are supposed to be God's children, who are supposed to have faith, who are supposed to believe that God conquers all. You have a king who is supposed to be called to, to fight for his nation, to lead the nation, to protect the nation. But the Bible says that when he came out and taunted them, the entire nation and Saul were all shook to the core. They all stood in fear. See, how often do we do this in life? How often do we know what is right? How do often do we know that what the culture is going to do and what they're doing is going to lead to their own destruction? We stand and we, and we know that their souls are going to be lost. We know that what the culture is doing is it's going to cost them and, and we love them. We should love them as the church. And so we're standing by and we're watching them march to their own destruction. We're watching them march toward the death and destruction of their own souls for an eternity. But we're so afraid of the culture. We're so afraid that maybe someone will say something bad and my, my reputation will be soiled if I stand up for the word of God that we're afraid to speak up. And we're so afraid to speak that our families, our circle of friends, 
We're watching them all and, and we're afraid to speak up. We're afraid to speak the word of God. Afraid that we'll lose the friendships. We'll, we'll, we'll lose those relationships. That our, our families will be divided. We're terrified. All the while, souls are being lost all around us. Just like Saul, we're standing in fear. Watching as God is mocked and defied. Imagine if you saw this, this rabid dog and then it was attacking a child. I know, kind of a severe thing to say, but hear me out. If you can picture yourself there and you see this rabid dog attack a child, are you going to think to yourself, now, if I start hitting that dog and I injure that dog, well, the, the owner's going to be offended. I might offend the owner if, if I hurt the dog. And, and if I hurt the dog, the, the owner might call the police and say that I've been too mean on the dog. And, and what, if the, what if the community hears that I was abusing this dog and they, and, and they don't like it? And, and what if my name is ruined? Is that all going to go through your head? Probably not. If you saw an, a, a child and a dog started to attack them, I could tell you exactly what you're probably going to do. You are probably going to run at that dog, and you are probably going to beat on that dog, and you could care less if the owner is yelling at you and screaming at you. You could care less if the community was mad at you. You could care less of the outcome of that dog and of what people think. What would be on your mind and what would be focused in your head was, I need to save the child. If the dog bites me, I don't care. I need to save the child. If the owner calls the cops, I don't care. I need to save the child. See, I think that the church needs to change a mindset. I, need, I think what we need to start thinking of is we need to start thinking of the enemy as a rabid dog, and I think we need to start fighting for our friends. I think we need to start fighting for our communities. We need to start fighting for our family. We need to start fighting for our nation, and we need to stop being afraid of what's being said. We need to stop being afraid of what might happen, and I think we need to start standing up and fighting for those we love. That's where I believe God has called us as a church. We need to stop being afraid. We need to start being full of faith and trust that God is going to fight this battle for us. Because see, in that very same battle, in that very same situation, another person steps onto the scene by the name of David. And David is going to face this battle a little different than Saul. See, 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 41, says this. Goliath walked toward David with a shield bearer ahead of him, sneering and in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come at me with a stick? He cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's army, the God of the armies of Israel, who you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you, and I will cut your head off, and then I will give the, your dead bodies to the, uh, to, to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel, and everyone assembled there will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and not with a spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. David arrives at the battlefield, the exact same battlefield, the exact same enemy. The exact same taunts. David doesn't stand by. David is actually astonished that these people are allowing this giant to stand up there and defy God's people. He is actually standing there astonished that God's people are standing there and letting him mock the God of Israel. He's standing there thinking, why are you people letting this happen? Why are you doing that? In this moment, David was not willing to stand by while God was being mocked. David was willing to risk everything. 
David was willing to go in front of those Israelites and risk being made fun of. He was willing to stand there and and have his his own brothers told him to go home. Remember that part of the story? He was really willing to risk the ridicule. He was willing to go out in front of the Philistines and be made fun of. He was willing to go out and risk his own body to be destroyed by this Philistine champion. He was willing to risk everything to stand up for God and for God's word. He was willing to risk it all. All of it. See, you might not realize this, but if you've read that story, when David walked out, he stood before Israel, who were all full of fear. He stood before a giant who was full of confidence and disdain toward God and his people. And he was standing before the masses of Philistines who were mocking Israel as well. So very quite literally, what we have is David walked out alone on that battlefield and stood among the masses as one. But the Bible tells us when David walked out there and in the physical, he stood alone on that battlefield while everyone around him had zero confidence and zero faith. David stood out there in the power, in the power and the strength of God Almighty. That's where David stood. That's where David stood. Is it possible at the reason that we will not stand against our families? Is it possible that we will not stand and the reason we will not stand for the word of God against our friends? And is it possible that the reason that we will not stand against a culture proclaiming the word of God is because we simply have no faith? Hear me out. Can you really say that God is your deliverer? And can we as the church really say That God is our deliverer and that God is our savior when the moment to stand up for God's words come and we refuse to speak because of fear. See, fear and faith do not occupy the same space at the same time. You either have fear or you have faith. You do not have both. And so you need to decide what it is that you've got. See, if we truly believe that it's God's battle and that we are simply vessels that God's going to use, then we're not going to fear the masses. We are not going to fear. We're not going to fear what people are going to say. We're not going to fear what people will do. We will not fear the outcome of standing for the word of God. We will simply stand for the word of God. We will run headlong into the battle by the power of God and trust him that his will will be done and victory will be had. See, you need to decide today. Who are you? Who are you? Where do you stand on this battlefield? Are you Saul? Are you willing to stand in fear while God's name is being mocked? Are you willing to stand by and watch as your family is being devoured by the enemy? Are you willing to stand by while your friends are being devoured by the enemy? Are you willing to stand by and watch as this culture is being devoured by the enemy? Who are you going to be? Are you going to stand in fear? while everyone around you is being destroyed? Or are you David? Are you going to be a David? Are you going to be willing to risk it all? Are you going to be willing to stand up for the ridicule and the bad names? Are you going to be willing to to stand up and and maybe have broken friendships and broken relationships? Are you willing to stand up for the word of God at all costs? Who are you? Are you David or are you Saul? Are you willing to risk it all and say this is the Lord's battle 
and he will give the enemy into our hands. Are you willing? See, I believe, this is where I'm going to conclude. I believe that the time has come that the church, the church has reached a pivotal moment in history and a pivotal moment in this country. And we need to stop being afraid. And we need to begin to stand up for the word of God once again. Because if we don't stand up for the word of God, we who, f- who know our called, we who are supposed to be the body of Christ, if we won't stand up for the word of God, who is? Who is? I wonder what would have happened. I wonder what would have happened if when David's brothers told him to go home, if he would have obeyed them. I wonder... What would have happened if when he went out and Goliath said, I'm going to feed you to the birds. If he said, I'm sorry, sir, I've made a big mistake. I wonder how different the story would be. I wonder how different that story might have ended up if there wasn't a David. See, each one of you, you have a choice. You're either a Saul or you're a David. And when you decide that you're going to be a David, God can do amazing things, incredible things. In fact, I want to read you Psalm 18, starting in verse 1. This is your battle cry. I love you, Lord. You are my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my Savior. My God is my rock and whom I find protection. He is my shield. The power that saves me and my place of safety. I call on the Lord who is worthy of praise and he saves me from my enemies. The ropes of death entangle me. Floods of destruction swept over me. The grave wrapped its ropes around me. Death laid a trap in my path. But in my distress, I cried out to the Lord. Yes, I prayed to my God for help. He heard me from his sanctuary. My cry to him reached his ears. When David walked out on that battlefield, he was not alone. When you walk out into the battlefield, you are not alone. You are not alone. Lord Jesus, I thank you for caring for us, for loving us. Jesus, I thank you for who you are. And God, I believe that the time has come that we need not to be ignorant and rude, but we need to stand up for what the Word of God says. I believe, Lord, that you are calling us out today. You're calling us out to be warriors without fear and full of faith. You're calling us to be Davids. And so, Jesus, I pray that each person hearing this whether here or at home, I pray, Jesus, that you would raise up Davids in this generation. I pray that you would raise up warriors that are not afraid of our culture, that are not afraid of the enemy, that are not afraid of what might happen, that they are so full of faith that they are willing to stand up for what is pure, what is right, what is righteous, and what is the word of God. Jesus, make us a church the entire church, let us be a generation of Davids, not a generation of Sauls. We have been a generation of Sauls far too long. And so now I ask God that you would empower us, you would strengthen us, and you would guide us. And in the holy name of Jesus, 